Hello and welcome to part two on our lecture series on the wars of religion in Europe. Today we're going to be focusing on Spain and Philip II here on Learning the Social Sciences. So who is Philip II? Well, he is the eldest son of the Habsburg Holy Roman Emperor Charles V or King of Spain Charles I. Yes, he's a guy with two different numbers after his name, depending on what country you are talking about. Now, Charles V went and gave up his power and actually went and spent the rest of his life in a monastery because, well, it was a lot. He had started to rule and reign in his teenage years and at some point ruling the Holy Roman Empire and Spain and now a whole bunch of colonies proved to be too much. And so he gave the Holy Roman Empire to his brother and Spain and all that it had uh, to his son, Philip. Does Spain have? Well, Spain has the Netherlands, Burgundy, uh, the Kingdom of Two Sicilies and Sardinia, and its growing colonies in the Americas. And so Philip II is going to use Spanish power and money coming over from the Americas to support Catholic causes in Europe, primarily military causes against the Protestants and also against Muslims. He is also going to show off the wealth and power of Spain with the construction of the Escorial, his royal residence, which is going to be built 26 miles northwest of Madrid. And of course, this is a quite large palace. It's going to have 14 entrance halls. It's going to have 88 fountains, 100 or sorry, 1,200 doors. It is going to have a lot and nine towers on it. It is also going to show the closeness of Spain with the Catholic Church because a monastery, the Monastery of San Lorenzo, is going to be built with the palace. And so that is going to definitely say, hey, in Spain, the Catholic Church and the monarchy are definitely buddy-buddy. It is a quite lavish residence, and it is going to be one of many palaces that is going to be coming up here in Europe to show the power of the monarchy. Of course, the best example of that, though, is going to be in France with Versailles. Now, Philip II of Spain is the most powerful man in Europe during his lifetime, until he kind of has a big defeat and loses his navy or the Spanish Armada in 1588 when he tried to go and invade England. Um, however, before that, he was very wealthy <clears throat> from all of the silver, gold, and other precious metals coming over from the Americas. He also um, has the highest tax percent on the peasantry than anywhere else in Europe. So think about this. He keeps getting in a whole bunch of money that he's stealing from the Americas, and he is taxing his peasantry at the highest rate? What is this? Well, it's actually going to cause some inflation, which is going to further cause economic problems within his country. Um, but, you know, we'll we'll get to that. Uh, but there is definitely a huge economic gap between the wealthy and the peasants within Spain. And a gap that you're not seeing in other locations, for example, England. Now, Philip does run an effective bureaucracy and military. And he goes off with his powerful navy and fights against the Ottoman Empire in the sea battle, the Battle of Lepanto on the Mediterranean. And it is to see who is actually in control of the Mediterranean. Is it going to be the Ottoman Empire or is it going to be European powers? Um, Spain is going to be victorious in this sea battle. And so now kind of Spain is the... Uh, power of the seas for the Mediterranean. Also, Philip goes in and suppresses kind of a resistance movement that was growing in Portugal, which also shows um, the power now of Spain even getting involved with matters in Portugal. Now, the big thing, though, for Philip is trying to reestablish Catholicism in areas that now have become Protestant. And the Netherlands is a colony of Spain at this time period, and they are converting over to Protestantism. And 
He does not like that. He being Philip II. So we're going to have some leaders coming up here in the Netherlands. We have Cardinal Greenville. He's a leader of the council in the Netherlands who wanted to check Protestant gains by um, church reforms. We also have William of Orange, who was kind of given this political power. Um, and he is going to be stating that <clears throat> Greenville should be removed from power. And then he actually is going to act on it. And he is going to actually go in and remove Greenville uh, from power. Um, just note that William of or Orange is definitely a Calvinist. He is very much Protestant. So we're going to have this event called the Compromise. And this is a solemn pledge by Philip II, King of Spain, with of Orange's brother, Louis of Nassau. Um, and and basically, they're going to kind of say, let's have peace be peace here. However, um, Philip is not going to allow this peace to uh, uh, remain. For example, part of this peace treaty, the compromise, is that the Inquisition is not going to be in place in the Netherlands. Um, but this is not something on Philip's long-term radar. So a revolt by the Protestants after they were called beggars by one of the regents um, is violently put down by Philip's um, Duke of Alba, who goes and executes thousands of what he calls heretics. Not people revolting, but heretics. And so this is now going to push the Netherlands into having their own independence movement. So William of Orange is going to come out from exile um, in Germany, and he is going to lead this movement against Spain. Now, Orange, of course, is also going to take over the Calvinist um, inclined northern territories. But the Spanish Netherlands are a little complex because the southern territories, which is going to become modern day Belgium, are still mainly Catholic. We are going to have this event called Spanish Fury, where Spanish mercenaries leave 7,000 people dead on November 4th, 1576. Now, this massacre is going to unite Protestants and Catholics alike in the Netherlands versus Spain because they're saying they are killing our countrymen. They're coming and killing us. We have to stop this bloodshed. And so they rise up against their king, and eventually Spain is going to sign the humiliating perpetual edict calling for the removal of all Spanish troops from the Netherlands. However, the southern provinces now get a little scared um, about actual, like, freedom with the Netherlands um, because they're kind of saying, well, hmm... We don't want to be in a country, though, that necessarily might be run by a whole bunch of Protestants. We're a little bit afraid of this. So they actually then go and run back to Spain and make a peace treaty, the Union of Arras. Uh, with this, William of Orange um, is going to be like, OK, um, let's, you know, say goodbye, Belgium. But now let's establish our country of the Netherlands. But he is going to then be assassinated and replaced by his son, Maurice, who, with the help of England and France, um, is going to kind of 100 percent make sure that Spain is defeated and Netherlands is now their own country. Now, although uh, Spain signed a peace treaty, uh, a truce with them in 1609. Um, the Netherlands is not going to be fully recognized in a peace treaty until the end of the Thirty Years' War with the signing of the Peace of Welf Westphalia in 1648. However, Philip II right now is having a rough time accomplishing his goal of re-Catholicizing Europe when now he has definitely lost the Spanish Netherlands. So this has been part two on our lecture series. Coming up next is going to be England, where we are going to continue to hear more of Philip II's story and bringing in Mary Tudor and Elizabeth I. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And definitely thank you for liking and subscribing. Bye-bye.